Welcome everyone, I hope you're warm because we're kicking off this edition of Out of Left Field at Wally Ice Fest in the Wall and Paw Pack area. I had a blast at the Ice Fest and let me tell you, organizing events like this is no easy task, especially when Mother Nature is involved. But in baseball, in life, and especially on this show, you always have to be ready for a good curveball. I guess more so in baseball than on the show you should be ready for a curveball. You know what, I'm overthinking it. Here's Wally Ice Fest. This is video from Wally Ice Fest 2018. Hockey, curling, fishing, and so much more on beautiful frozen lake wall and paw pack. Watching this video, you may think you need ice for Wally Ice Fest to be successful. It's uh, very stressful. Uh, you do a lot of planning and then it all goes out the window because uh, when you announce you don't have ice, we lose half the teams right there. So it's kind of a minor miracle that guys are showing up. Well, yeah, okay, ice helps, but when life gives you lemons, you make lemonade. Then you grab your hockey stick, sneakers, and street curling stones, and finally you dump out the lemonade and fill up your cup with something stronger. Here's to Wally Ice Fest 2020. So we rolled up to Wally Ice Fest. There, there was a lack of ice. Weather's crazy in this area. And I thought, oh man, the Anthracite Curling Club isn't going to be here today. But here we are, you guys are here. We're gonna talk about how you invented kind of street curling. But um, walk me through what is kind of like, or give me some advice. What should I do as I'm throwing this stone? We're gonna start here at the back line. Okay. All right, you're gonna take about three steps and get your momentum going and kind of give it a hurl. Okay. What we have here are three caster wheels, okay? And the caster wheels let it move in any direction. So first thing you wanna do is try to get your caster wheels all going forward. And I got three steps. I'm gonna go a little press on that. Oh, oh. That's just like my basketball yeah, shot. Yeah. That was great. yeah, yeah. There you go, there you go. Yay! Oh wow, I'm in terrible shape. But that, uh, I'm gonna blame it on the three layers of pants. That was great, okay. When plans A and B fail, Matthew Lyons, co-founder of the Anthracite Curling Club, says his group is ready with plan Q, street curling. We call this uh, uh, street curling. Okay. Uh, we also refer to it as tar spiel. Some 15 years ago, we had difficulty getting ice, and I was changing my brakes on my truck, and one tire fell over on a creeper and rolled down and bounced off another tire, and I said, I think I have an idea. And so I created these uh, curling stones, if you will, out of 15-inch uh, spare tires and three caster wheels and some plywood. And they curl rather well, like a curling stone. However, we do it on a much shorter sheet. Um, they weigh about 38 pounds, where a curling stone weighs between 38 and 42 pounds. They're bigger in diameter, and you kind of have to take three steps with them, but it's a lot of fun and when you don't have ice it is a good fallback plan. The organizers of Wally Ice Fest 2020 Pond Hockey Tournament came up with a little plan Q of their own. First off, the hockey games would be played on street courts at Watonka Outdoor Facilities. Second, they would have field games for the teams to participate in. Actually, a lot of us guys grew up working at resorts, you know, being, being here in the Poconos. So, Woodlock Pines, Cove Haven, Silver Birches, all these big resorts were in customer service. So we put our heads together, you know, stealing some of the games they do, Winter Olympic types, and um, put that together as something to do off the court. You know, guys running around get pretty tired, so it's a way to just relax and have some fun like target shooting. And, Keg throwing. Will, will there be a prize? Is the score being kept there or is this just for fun on this side of the... Yeah, actually the field events count okay. as much as a game. Oh, no kidding, okay. Yeah, so we count a game and a field event really cool. and then weight that into back into hockey playoffs. And then in the end, uh, we have a trophy, 
We have a lot of swag, prizes. I bumped into Team New from Maryland near the fire and they seem to be having fun with the field games and enjoying themselves overall. A lot of us got together because we started in a clinic. Uh, it was an adult clinic, so we started late in life playing this game. And you know, we've just hung together ever since, just having a good time. Why hockey? Why did you get into it? Why did you pick that? Uh, no good no reason. reason. <laughs> Somehow fell in. We were all drinking one night and said, hey, let's play hockey. <laughs> I'm learning more and more that these two things are interconnected a little bit. Um, As a matter of fact, I think the only game we've really won so far was beer pong, so that's definitely in our wheelhouse. <laughs> We'll get to the hockey, I promise, but before we head back out, let's stay warm by the fire while we learn about the history of Wally Ice Fest. It started from pickup hockey. Uh, a bunch of guys playing on the pond, a little private pond. We'd gather and started growing. Facebook group got more and more people, and we got more and more organized. So we decided to do a, a little reunion game of Pawpack High School against uh, a men's league team. And um, that, that's how the idea grew. A lot of people said they'd all show, and it went from there. And then we fell right behind Ice Tea Golf as one of the events of Wally Ice Fest. When we formed everything, it was with the Ice Tea Golf Tournament as the lead. And uh, it's been a, a, a good mix. Bruce Redock of the Scranton Mavericks is involved in a field game right now, but when he's done, he's going to talk about playing hockey outdoors. Redock grew up in Long Island, New York, playing hockey and moved to Northeast Pennsylvania a few years ago. All right, the Mavericks just wrapped up this supersized beer pong challenge game, so let's hear from a victorious Redock. It's not often that you utilize the, the outdoor, outdoor areas for winter recreation. Most of your winter recreation is indoors. For us, it's important, you know, not often do you get organized pond hockey. Most times it's guys that come on out, you know, a couple sticks, a couple skates, and have the opportunity to skate together. Nothing serious. Not that this is serious, but uh, it's important that we welcome guys, you know, like from West Virginia to Northeast Pennsylvania. Um, for, for us, it's our ability to showcase what we have here in Northeast PR. Samuel Taylor plays for the West Virginia Warriors. It's been awesome. Um, I mean, we only have like a couple small retention ponds that might freeze over once or twice every two years. So this is like, you know, this is the roots of hockey. So being up here in the mountains um, where it's a little bit colder and, and it's just, it's really cool. And the fact they're still on the ground, it just kind of has the whole hockey feel. Now, let's watch some hockey. I think everybody, you know, everybody's competitive. Yeah. Once you start to get involved, even these little like silly games, yeah. you know, um, well, you still kind of go for it. Um, but uh, but I, I think the camaraderie is the biggest thing. Um, and I think kind of being out in the cold makes it that way too. Like you're, you're kind of putting up with something in a way and you're doing something that everybody, you know, has a passion for. So there's automatically a connection there. And I think that's what makes it really special. But there's definitely some, some competitiveness out there, you know. But after the games, everybody's shaking hands and giving fist bumps and stuff, so. Wally Ice Fest 2020 was a little bit different from years past. But in life, just like in hockey, sometimes you have to roll with the punches. So here's to Plan Q and everyone who had a blast at Wally Ice Fest 2020. Coming up, a shoot around with one of the area's leading scorers in basketball. Marion's Tyler Fritz will toss in baskets while we toss some trivia his way. Welcome back to Left Field and the interesting view we get of local sports from way out here. Tyler Fritz is one of the best boys basketball players in our area. He's honed his skills through countless hours of work and sure pays off during games, but is he mentally strong enough to endure our trivia challenge? Let's find out and learn more about Tyler Fritz. So Tyler, do you have like a sweet spot? Is there like somewhere in the court you love to shoot from where you're like just money I mean, from? You're like, I like to top the key a lot, the but, key? but I can shoot anywhere. <laughs> Here at Marion Catholic High School with Tyler Fritz. He's a senior this season. Been scoring for the Marion Colts for a while. And off camera, we were having a discussion about whether you've always been a scorer or if that's something that came along later in career, your career. And you were telling me, no, you weren't always the scorer. You weren't always the guy, maybe in grade school, stuffing the statute. So how did that come along? I mean, it's got to put in that work. It, it's a lot of work. It's hours grinding. Um, 
perfecting your craft, like it just doesn't come naturally. You gotta put in the work. So you talked about putting the work and you kept saying putting the work and putting the work. What does that look like? When you say that, what, what do you mean by, what were you doing specifically? I mean, was it just putting extra time in the gym, shooting a lot more? What, what, what equated to success for you? Um, it was getting up at four in the morning, no lifting, lifting before school. Where would you lift, here or would you go like at home? Nah, there's a place in Eagle Rock where I lift. Okay. Um, and then I'd come home, i lift again, and then i shoot. What else are you doing, man? That's it. it really? Yep. Other than basketball, really? Not That's like anything it. else? Honestly, yeah. What's been a memorable moment from your career up to this point? Do you remember a big shot you took or? Um, district championship game, my freshman year. Uh, I got a pass from Ryan Karcher in the corner and I made it and the place went nuts. The deepest cut of the night made by Marion came from freshman Tyler Fritz. This three-pointer gave Marion a 36-35 lead going into the final quarter. All right, so I want to ask about the three-pointer at the end of the third quarter. Give you guys that lead. I mean, just you, you seem, I was right in that corner. Do you know what was going in? Yes, I did because I practiced so much. I worked so hard on my shot. I just have the confidence to take the shot wherever, and I just think it's going in every time. Your brother's on the team as well. How's yeah. he doing? He's doing good. He just needs to shoot the ball more, yeah. Okay. How do you how do you encourage? Like that's what maybe what I was asking you earlier about being a leader. How do you maybe try to get someone like your brother to shoot a little bit more or he's gotta tell him to shoot the ball more. Like he's very efficient from behind the arc right now. I just don't know why he's not shooting it. And I need him to. What, did you at that point in your career though too? You said you used to wait and kind of wait for that yeah. shot, you know, maybe in the corner before you became a scorer. What made you make that transition from the guy waiting to the guy maybe taking over a game? Um, the like players that we had, they graduated, they okay. left, so I had to take that role. I had to step up. Why do you love it so much, man? I mean, from fifth grade when you really fell in love with the sport, I mean, what about it really hooked you? I don't know. It's just the big games. You got your student section. Like, I play for that. I love that kind of stuff. And instead of sitting on the sidelines, I want to be the one making stuff happen on the court. You see, did you always have that confidence, that feeling of, I want to be in there, I want to be in the big moment? Yes and no, but... Well, I think everybody has it yeah. like they fantasize, like, oh yeah, I made the yeah, big yeah. shot or something, but I think it's a very different thing to be in there and actually want it to happen. Yeah, I want to be in there because I know at the end of the day, I put in that work, so good things will happen. When good things don't happen, how do you deal with it? You said you had to learn a little bit how to yeah. deal with that? When they don't happen, you just gotta stick to the plan, keep working, and use it as a lesson. Well, here's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna go out on the court right now. We're gonna shoot around a little bit, test you mentally, also see how the shooting game's going, toss some trivia questions at you, and some more questions about your game. So we're gonna hit the right. court right now. How many shots do you think you can make in like five minutes? Is this exhausting? Is five um, minutes a lot of time, should I? No, no, that's good. I don't okay. know. I don't know, actually. Let's just see. I'm gonna say 20. Ready? I'm starting the clock now. What fictional Kansas town is the home of Superman when he was growing up? I have no idea. No idea? Okay. In what country was Albert Einstein born? Country. What did you say? Germany. Germany? That is correct, sir. And I think you're at two. Um, what does ambidextrous mean? Um, you can use you can do stuff with both hands. That's correct. What are the main ingredients, the two main ingredients in mayonnaise? Um, eggs and water. Eggs and oil, but not, we'll, we'll go a half a point for, for that one. Okay, who was the first player in NBA history to be elected unanimously as the MVP? Do you know without multiple choice? Steph Curry. That is correct, do you know what year it was? Um, 2016. Dude, that was really good, that was nice. How many points do you currently have? Do I currently have? Oh man, I don't know. Uh, it's in the 1500s. Um, who is the all-time leading scorer here? Do you know? Joe Horvat, I think. Is that like a realistic thing within reach? Like, can you beat him? Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty close. Is that a goal you have? Yeah, it's one of my goals. I mean, it's awesome. I just had to take it all in, like actually realize that I accomplished that goal and I couldn't do it without my teammates, my family, and everybody supporting me. Let's talk about how you develop shooting in that. Like how often do you do something like this, just shoot around? Um, every day. Every day? How long? Um, it depends. I usually go for like two hours. Do you get frustrated when you play ever? Like if you miss a shot, are you at a point now where you're kind of relaxed, kind of chill? Um, it depends. I don't usually get frustrated that easily, but there's some times that I do. If you could give yourself advice, 
If you could go back and talk to your freshman self, what would you say? Hit the weight room. Really? Yep. When did you start to bulk up? This off season, actually. And who'd you work with? Did you work with anybody or is it just like dad? What do you think the biggest difference is since you added some weight? Um, it allowed me to play down low a little bit better, being the post. Here, now you can analyze what's wrong with my shot. Look how embarrassing this is. I actually know exactly what it is because we did one of these segments before, but this is highly embarrassing. <laughs> that ain't what, what, what did I do wrong? I just gotta get the ball up a little bit more. Hey, there. Oh, all right, all right, one more. Come on, you gotta make it. I got one. How would you encourage your teammates? If I was one of your teammates right now and I was just bricking them, what would you say? I'd say keep shooting. Do you talk with kids sometimes? Like, do you see yourself as a leader who. I do. There you go. 17 seconds. Um, what's the capital of Alaska? Uh, Juno. Nice. 10 seconds. Um, eight plus six. 14. Dude, that was good. I never would have been able to do that. That's time. Coming up, he's led men to state football championships and taught them lessons for life away from the field. Dave Whitey Williams talks about one of his former players who's now the general manager of the Super Bowl champion Kansas City Chiefs next. Hey everyone, thanks for coming back for more Out of Left Field. When Pennsylvania Scholastic Football Coaches Association Hall of Famer Dave Whitey Williams stopped by our studio to talk about his former player and current Kansas City Chiefs general manager Brett Veach, he noticed I had a football on the table as a prop. He politely asked if he could go to his car and bring in a prop of his own to replace this football I found in my office. This is the story of the football he brought in and the man who sent it to him and why both are pretty impressive. Pennsylvania coaching legend joining me right now, Dave Whitey Williams. He's from the Tamaqua area, won a few state titles with Mount Carmel. You also coached though at Shenandoah Valley, Tamaqua in our area here, and then finished your career at Nazareth. Number one, thank you just for coming in and taking the time to talk about one of your former players, Brett Veach, who's the general manager for the Kansas City Chiefs. So he was on what, your first state championship team at Mount Carmel? Well, the first state championship team... And he played what position? What position? He was a running back, but uh, he was so diverse, we, we would spread. We, we, we were kind of, I was a Don Coriel fan, and the Air Coriel, we were, we were kind of, I won't say ahead of our time, but uh, we, were spread, we started spreading the field, and he sometimes would play receiver, but he was very much special teams. He, and when I look at uh, a guy that plays for him now, Tyreek Hill, if you look at Tyreek Hill at that level, that's where Brett was an example at the uh, high school level. He was very similar. I don't remember what newspaper this was in, but I was reading an article from a local newspaper about your run to the state title and Brett playing, I think, I believe, maybe it was a state championship game, you could correct me, but time was running out in the game and, and maybe it was in the playoffs to get, I forget what the situation was, but he went out of bounds at like the one or two yard line with seconds left. And my head, because I'm a soccer player, I'm like, why do you go out of bounds? What happened here? But it set you guys up perfectly. What was? Do you know what story I'm talking about? I do about know, there? and yeah. it was 1994. It was that year, and ironically, and I know within the coverage area, it was against Dallas. And Teddy Jackson, the head coach, and I are very good friends. And he, they had won the state championship in '93, and we hit Brett on a pass, and. It looked like he might have had the opportunity to make a move and maybe score, but he did. He looked at the clock and he stepped out of bounds like on about the 25 yard line. It was about the 25 okay, so and there was one second to go. And uh, this is a funny story within our staff and all the players that ever played. And uh, I had one word for one play. It was called Twisty. And Twisty comes from the tornado. I, I, I sold it that we were going to uh, kick it and what happened I, as I was leaving the huddle I said one word and it was t twisty and twisty was our fake field goal. That play in itself I think really you know when you talk about 1994 winning a, the first state championship with that play is legendary in Mount Carmel tradition and history. His title when he first got involved with the Eagles he was assistant to the head coach and assistant to the head coach basically was 
to me, his gopher. Okay, it was like in the office. If you're a fan of the office, they had assistant to the regional manager. He's assistant to the coach. Got you. And he was under his wing, and it was funny to. It, I would tease Brett often. I'd say, "What are you going to do this forever?" And one day he looked at me. He said, "Coach, someday I'm going to be a general manager." And it kind of, you know, set me back a little bit. I I, I gave him a little bit of a chuckle, and it was like, "Yeah, right." And uh, ironically, oh. as time went on, he. With the Eagles, Andy moved him into scouting, and he was a pro scout because in, in, in that, at that level, they have pro and college scouts. And then they have a guy overlooking both the pro and college scouting. And what happened was he was involved with the scouting with the Eagles, but when Andy had gone out to Kansas City, he put Brett overlooking. He was the guy that would overlook both the pro and college scouting, and, and uh, he was the one that brought in Patrick Mahomes. And I had the opportunity to meet Patrick myself, and uh, uh, you know, when you look at Brett and, you look, and, and the opportunity to get to know Andy, I mean, when you look at the character of the whole thing, um, I mean, sometimes you look at things in, in programs, and programs get a bad rap, reputation and things, but right now I think uh, the Kansas City Chiefs right now are showing some great character uh, from the top to the bottom. I got to meet Mr. Hunt, uh, his uh, sister, and many others, and I, I just look at that franchise and I can see why, after knowing Brett from Mount Carmel, I can see why they want him in the program. Seems like a family atmosphere maybe yes. in, in Kansas City. When people say co-region, I think even when I talk with some Penn State football coaches, and I mentioned Co-Region, I think when James Franklin was making his rounds around here, the first thing people say is blue collar and, and hard working. And I read that story, this story about Brett when he was with the Eagles, sleeping in his office because Andy Reid wanted to get to work at like 4 a.m. or 5 a.m. And I thought, that's crazy. I don't know if I'd be able to do these things. That work ethic, was that there, that blue collar work, Co-Region, well, toughness? Well, with, without, <laughs> he, he has a wonderful family. He has three children, his wife Allison is super, and. They understand, they've been around the game, they're growing with the game, and uh, when you're involved in football, and believe me, I, I was fortunate as I, as a coach, I spent a lot of time watching film and, you know, late at night scouting and doing things and preparing, and uh, the fact that Bobby was on my staff, I think Brett saw that. Sometimes I might call them at ungodly hours and Donna was like what's he calling for you know but uh, something came up and uh, something came in my mind offensively and that phone would ring and they had, our children were young then but uh, there were some ungodly hours that I was putting in as well and uh, I think it all rubs off. So you think Brett saw that back then and kind of knew what he was what he was getting into in, in a football family. Leading up to the Super Bowl you're texting with Brett and you say, hey, we're doing a, they're doing a fundraiser back here for Babe Conroy. Lots of you in the Hazleton area will know Babe. He was working at the Standard Speaker for a long time, was my boss. Very well known in the Shenandoah area, um, in the athletic community there. There's a scholarship set up for him doing a fundraiser for that. You text Brett, Super Bowl time, and you said, hey, is there anything, you know, can you help us out? And you said immediately, um, like the next day you had a football, and this is actually signed by Patrick Mahomes. Babe Conroy, and that was my first head coaching job at Shenandoah, and I'll, I'll always remember. And as you mentioned, Babe was just one of those guys, special guys. And uh, uh, with the scholarship for the nation, I, I, I texted Brett and I said, Brett, can you help us out with something signed? And I was expecting maybe he signed, because I had a ball signed by Brett, he sent me. And he said, within two minutes, I see this picture of this ball. And he said, it's in the mail. And uh, it's a day later. and. I have the ball, in fact, it's ironic, I had it in the car because I just picked it up. You don't make it on your own, and uh, team is always the key thing, and I think both Brett and Andy bring that to the table with the Kansas City Chiefs, and uh, certainly they, they found a good one in Patrick Mahomes, who's a special man. As people are seeing all these stories about Brett, I'm in the local area, but also nationally now he's getting the attention. What would you like our viewers to really know about him, his, his personality as, as we're getting ready to sign off here? Well, I, I think the, the fact is, uh, I, I, I wrote a poem to Brett when he, believe it or not, I taught language arts and I really like poetry and I wrote this poem and his grandfather, Pooch, who would be so proud today, and his grandmother, Stella, it trickles down. There's a lot of love, a lot of family. Yeah. Right there. So when you wrote this to him, this was when he first became the... General Manager. I'll share it with you. All right.
Well, I thank you so much for your time and sharing all these stories today. And like I said, it was an honor to have you come in, you know, let alone your, you know, your resume as a coaching legend here in the state, taking some time for us, but also sharing the story of your former player, Brett Feach, who's now the general manager of the Kansas City Chiefs. And Coach, thank you so much for your time today. Thank really, you, Kenny. Really appreciate, appreciate it. it. Thank you. That's it for another edition of Out of Left Field. Remember, you can go to ssptv.com to check out past episodes. They're archived there. Until next time, take it easy, everyone.